Okay, so I'll make a start. Um, people are still joining, but I'll just say a quick hello and welcome. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you for joining us. It's lovely to see so many of you here. And again, sorry for anybody that missed my initial apology for the slight technical issues at the beginning. Um, really hope you get a lot from this session this afternoon. We're very lucky to be joined by the wonderful Dr. Sophie Mitchell. So thank you for joining us, Sophie. Um, the first part of this afternoon will be a presentation by Sophie, and then there will be a question and answer session to follow the presentation. So if you could put any questions that you've got in the chat box, please. If you do want to keep your chats, uh, your question private on the chat, my colleague Max, who's joined us today, will be um, the one dealing with the question and answer. So when you could go on this, the chat box, there's um, a drop down arrow if you just want to select that the question just goes to mags and not to everybody that's absolutely fine um there are quite a few of us so we will try to get to all the questions but apologies if we don't we are here uh, if you do need us and you haven't had your questions answered so please do just feel free to email us live chat you can use our lovely new live chat support function or give the helpline call but we will try to get through as many questions as we can um, the session is being recorded because it's uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you miss anything today, then feel free to go back and view it on the YouTube channel. Um, and you have all entered on mute. So if you could just remain on mute, that will be great, please. Um, we'll be sending out an evaluation form after the event. Please do just take some time to fill it in. It really helps us to know what's worked and what hasn't. Apart from the Zoom link, we already know about that, that that didn't work. Um, but it really helped your views help us to change uh, to to shape the, the um, events moving forward. So any suggestions and feedback that you've got, we'd really appreciate it. So I will stop talking and I will hand over to Sophie. Thanks, Sophie. Lovely. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in, joining us today to think a little bit more about how we can cope with um, thoughts and feelings uh, when living with a migraine uh, condition. First off, I always think it's important to uh, a state for the record of course that I'm a, a psychologist and um, I think that by now I've heard every response that I can have to my job title both personally and uh, professionally I appreciate it can feel intimidating sometimes the idea of seeing a psychologist or speaking to one um, and uh, common worries that I hear is that I might be here to tell you that the pain is all in your head or it's related to some deep dark trauma um, but in fact I am here to support the emotional impact that migraines can have on life and um, we know this isn't just a physical experience but affects so many other different parts of life equally there are some psychological strategies and uh, ideas that can be helpful for building quality of life um, even in the presence of migraine so broadly speaking um, that is what my role here is to do there's no one um, set way that psychologists work and there's no one set way of coping with thoughts with feelings or of course with living life uh, the ideas that I'm here to talk about are from a broad range of um, therapies that are often utilized across the UK but particularly when working with people with physical health difficulties such as migraine um, the experiences that I'm talking about are related to my own work in uh, working in headache services and that has been across the age range um, um, and equally across different headache conditions whilst we're here to talk about migraine. Um, so I hope there'll be something for everyone. So essentially what we're kind of thinking here is recognizing um, that there are a few different processes that can go on. It's really easy for us um, in any situation to get caught in kind of particular patterns that can happen. Um, so for instance, this you might notice kind of particular difficulties that come up for you either during an attack itself or perhaps between attacks as well, other difficulties. A common pattern might be that when an attack starts um, that you might have lots of different thoughts around um, feeling like you can't cope with this, this feels really hopeless, so general ideas about the condition and treatment, um, or perhaps even thoughts about things you might not be able to do today because of that attack, whereas about letting other, other people down, for instance. That, of course, is really difficult to experience, so quite naturally you might notice different emotions come up for you. 
feeling quite fearful of the pain or of other situations and um, feeling quite sad and hopeless or a sense of guilt um, around the impact that migraine can have on other people. Naturally, our bodies are designed to respond to different emotions that happen for us. So you might notice that feeling sad leaves you feeling really lethargic, feels, feel, leaves you feeling like you can't be bothered to do things, more fatigue. You might notice increasing in that tension, shoulder tension, neck tension. For some people, this can mean then a heightened um, pain and heightened symptoms. Obviously not for everyone, but lots of people do notice these kind of patterns play out. Obviously, we're all doing everything we can just to survive and respond to those difficulties that happen. So you might notice then that particular behaviours come out. You might feel like you need to just kind of shut off from others, either to cope with the attack or to cope with the impact that's having on you. It might be that then the more time then you're spending kind of worrying and having more thoughts and more feelings, um, or that equally perhaps in the future you feel like it's better off to avoid um, kind of having, having plans, for instance, to not get caught in this loop but equally this can leave you feeling even um, more low even more hopeless so we know therefore that there is these kind of all these different links that does happen with things what I would add is that this isn't about you doing anything wrong because this is a really, really natural process and equally one that is affected by many, many other factors and because you don't live in a bubble. So you're affected by the responses from other people, how other people respond to migraine difficulties, how people respond to emotions and to uh, mental health. So it's not that anyone has done anything wrong. Um, the really, it's really tricky when we get caught in these cycles. However, being in a cycle does mean it gives us a few different options for avenues where we can offer you something different and ways to break the cycle. So again, we're going to look at a few different strategies from a couple of different um, types of uh, therapeutic approaches. Okay, so if we examine first looking at thoughts. So, in my therapy room, I often hear a range of different uh, thoughts in relation to migraine. These are the kind of really common ones, often feeling like people never uh, understand, feeling like it's never getting better, feeling like you're leaving, letting others down, family, colleagues, etc., or feeling like you can't cope, or particularly when treatments aren't working out that can leave people feeling like they're a treatment failure. We know it's not just those original thoughts that can be difficult but equally then an added layer of those difficult thoughts. So then we have thoughts about the thoughts and thoughts about the fact that you're struggling with migraine. So why can't I just switch my brain off? Everyone's telling me to think positively. Why can't I do that? I just need to stop thinking about it or any kind of fears and thoughts we have that we might be going mad. Um, that, yeah, there is, there is a kind of meaning to all of these difficulties that we're feeling. So what we can think about with, with how we can manage some of these thoughts that come up is coming back to this original kind of difficult thought. And one of the approaches taken from a therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy is about kind of changing the content of that original thought. So for instance, if we have that original thought of, I can't cope with this attack, it's unbearable. We could see if there's a different take on it. We could think a little bit more, is this definitely a fact or is this an opinion? Is this something that I'm really feeling? Is there maybe evidence that this isn't true? Or perhaps, you know, what, what would I advise a friend or even someone else who was on this chat and this session today? And this isn't about the positive thinking. Often we find positive thinking is just kind of, kind of really, really difficult and really challenging, particularly when living in a migraine context and might not actually be that helpful. So instead, this is thinking about well, what is a balanced and realistic perspective on this that might acknowledge that things are difficult, but I have a sense of coping. For instance, then, okay, this is hard, but I've coped before with, with the attacks and I can cope again. I need to go back to my plan. I need to work out how, how I can face this to remember that I can cope. Okay, so this is one approach and this is often our kind of common sense view of how we might manage different difficulties that come up. However, what often happens is that um, there might be thoughts in migraine that are particularly true. Um, 
uh, you know, particularly when we're thinking about how difficult it can be, um, or it might be that there's a thought that still lingers and it's still just kind of really weighing heavily. Instead, then we can take a different approach. So if this kind of fits in better for you, this is an approach um, taken from uh, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. And this is more about how we change the relationship that we have to our thoughts. So in knowing that thoughts are a thing that your brain does, um, there are gonna be different thoughts that pass through at different times. So instead, this is about looking at that particular thought, thinking, well, where does this kind of particularly come from? This might be a thought that actually comes from a parent, from a family, from a colleague, and it's them kind of feeding in rather than my true view. Remembering that my brain is really good at coming up with all these difficult things, and it's really good at coming up with thoughts. However, I can watch it without necessarily buying into it. A helpful way to view this sometimes is imagining, so if you're going on Facebook and you're scrolling through and there's all those targeted ads that have always been aware of what you've just been thinking about or Googling or talking about, and there's those really targeted ads that really know how to get you, but sometimes what we do is we keep scrolling without necessarily clicking on the link, putting the product in your basket and going to check out. It's that same thought and kind of recognizing that some of those thoughts that come up for us may just be a targeted Facebook ad. So sometimes some of these metaphors can be helpful. There's a particular exercise I do with people um, that might uh, illustrate this a little bit more. So for instance, if we have the thought of, um, oh, I need to move everyone, um, this is unbearable and I can't cope, we might notice that in really buying into that thought that emotionally that feels really charged, really challenging. You might notice that physical reaction that you have to that and that feeling really difficult. However, if we add a couple of words of, I have a thought that this is unbearable and I can't cope. Just see what that does. See if that kind of takes off the weight around the thought and kind of recognizing this is just a thought that is happening for me right now. Equally then bringing in another layer, I notice I have a thought that this is unbearable and I can't cope. So bringing in a little bit of that awareness, we talk about this sometimes as kind of mindfulness type practice um, and kind of thinking that we're just here to notice that different thoughts are going through the system, but I don't have to buy into this. Okay. So that's just a couple of different ways in which we can manage and think about thoughts. We're going to look now a little bit more at uh, emotions more specifically. Now, emotions tend to get quite a bad rep in my therapy room in that I have lots of people who come in saying, I just want to feel happy all the time. I don't want to feel worried. I don't want to feel sad. However, emotions are a really important part of what it is to be human. What we know is that emotions are often quite linked to our, our thoughts and our kind of brain process and equally very, very linked to our physical reactions. So you might know that you're feeling anxious because of that tightness in the chest, butterflies in the tummy. You might know you're feeling sad with a kind of heavy heart type sensation. So often this is a way that we can kind of really try and connect what that emotion is. The tricky thing with emotion is that often that one can lead to the other. So often what I see, for instance, is a pattern of feeling quite fearful around the pain or um, around a different situation uh, associated with migraine that might lead people to um, feeling quite sad about the condition and the impact that it's having on them. People then often go on to compare themselves to others to feel guilty about the fact that they're struggling and suffering with this and that they are feeling sad as well. So we often what we see then is that the original emotion just becomes one little part of the picture that there's then all these kind of added layers that's been added on that then becomes more difficult than the original fear and of course that is really challenging so what we have to consider then is is it the original emotion that's the problem or is it how we respond to all these different emotions so thinking about how 
you know, um, anger, for instance, has a really bad reputation um, that we have uh, lots of different cultural ideas about how we should be responding to emotions, thinking of UK culture and kind of generations of the stiff upper lip approach, that often that can create more difficulties than just experiencing emotions. And this is here that we need to remember that every emotion we have, every emotion we experience is designed to do something to help us survive and thrive as human beings. So whether you um, think that how that's happened is that that has been gifted to us or how we've evolved, either way, they all serve a purpose. So for instance, in thinking about that, that fear response is there designed to help you trigger your fight or flight system, to help you um, bat off a lion when we were living in caves. But now the brain is still responding in that same way. So that migraine attack can become a threat to the system and therefore that triggers that uh, sensation for us. Thinking then about anger is a way that we can kind of resolve different challenges, again, triggering that kind of fight instinct or resolving different difficulties um, that happen in the world. So everything has a purpose, everything is needed. So we have to think about how to manage that. However, that being said, you might want to um, still have a few ideas and a bit of a emotional toolkit to help you cope with some of these difficulties. So this is just one tiny, tiny little section, um, cross, cross section, if you like, of all kind of different approaches we can take when we're managing emotions or try them do, to, to do them justice. But this definitely doesn't compare to kind of full uh, psychological therapy. One of the strategies we often find that can be quite helpful is just kind of taking a moment to really name the emotion as you feel it come up to kind of take a moment just to stop to notice to be aware and to connect with that maybe in a slightly more understanding way to remember what that purpose is oh okay I notice that I'm feeling a bit anxious I notice that my um, heartbeat is going up a little bit more my body right now is trying to tell me that I need to do this right that this is really Im Im important to me or my body needs me to know that it's trying to find, find, find a way to feel safe. So just remembering that sometimes can be helpful. Another approach, therefore, in that kind of compassionate type approach, so these are ideas taken from a compassion-focused therapy, is equally acknowledging that this is an understandable reaction to difficult circumstances, that you did not ask for this. You did not ask for migraine. You did not ask for sadness, for fear or guilt. Therefore, it's really understandable that this is what's happening to you right now. When people find it really difficult to have a sense of compassion towards themselves, it can be helpful to imagine a role model if you like, of someone that you visualize as being kind of really compassionate. This might be someone you know. It might be an animal, a dog in particular. Dogs often come up in this. Or it might be a celebrity or a kind of big figure. It doesn't matter who that is. That could be anyone from the Dalai Lama to Beyonce. Just whoever kind of connects for you as someone who would be compassionate and caring towards your difficulty. And that instead we can think, OK, so how would they respond to me right now? And what would they say to me? What would they do? And how would they hold me perhaps in, in a way that feels kind of really comforting, kind of bring in that sense of compassion to cope with that emotion? Another thing, another approach that people find quite helpful is to kind of physicalize some of this uh, emotion and to kind of make it a bit more tangible and real. So whether that's about giving it a shape, giving it a color, a lot of people find this quite helpful to kind of um, focus more on the image of the emotion to help them ride that through. Um, so for instance, in recognizing um, anger as a red circle, focusing on the red circle, not needing to kind of push or dismiss that, but just allowing that there um, in order for us to work through it in a manageable way. Some people find that kind of focusing more on the physical aspect of the emotion can be more helpful than the kind of heady stuff uh, and, and all of the thoughts. However, some people with physical health difficulties can find that challenging. So yeah, that, that may vary. 
equally, what we want you to remember is that actually every emotion is temporary. Every emotion is just one bit of your landscape in the same way that migraine is just one bit of you. A helpful image for this is often the idea of remembering that the weather is always changing. Sometimes there's sun, sometimes there's rain, but the sky is the thing that is always constant and never changes. In times of real struggle with emotional difficulty, um, real overwhelming emotion, it can be helpful to have some strategies that you can use just to ground yourself, to stabilize a little bit. So when things are just feeling a bit chaotic and out, we kind of need to have a way to come back to the body, to come back to the ground. And there's lots of different ideas that you can use with this. Again, I could talk about this for another hour. Um, I'm gonna use my most popular one, uh, this is called the 54321 game. Um, this often comes up on social media. So you may uh, have, have seen this before. Essentially, it's the idea that when we are feeling a bit out of it, um, when uh, perhaps we're kind of caught in the thought stuff, um, when the body feels a little bit unreal, a bit hazy, um, that we can kind of come back again and feel reconnected to a sense of safety in, in the body. Um, uh, in my experience, people find this helpful for situations of kind of panic attacks, um, or if they're just kind of feeling a little bit like they're struggling, feeling a bit blue. Um, some people do find it helpful at different stages um, of a migraine attack, particularly in kind of um, the, the one I hear the most is using it in the kind of hangover effect, when you're just trying to reconnect a little bit again to the body and to the world. So I'm going to encourage you to try this with me. I will talk you through it if you don't fancy trying it and you just want to watch me go through it. So essentially, we're just naming um, different things that we notice associated with each of our senses, a little bit like if you were just writing a shopping list and we're just going with a full detail. So first, I'm going to name so five things that I can see. So I can see uh, the pink on the number five on my screen. I can see my lamp. I can see the little flicker of the webcam light. Um, I can see my phone uh, next to me. I can see the white on my keypad. I think that was five. Next, I can check in and notice four things I can feel with my skin and sense of touch. So I can feel my um, toes pushing into my shoes. I can feel the um, headset on my ears. I can feel the uh, my t-shirt brushing against my skin. I can feel my hair on my neck. And three things I can hear. I can hear my own voice, I can hear a neighbor next door, and I can hear traffic in the background. Two things I can smell, I can smell my detergent from my clothes and my perfume. I can taste um, the snack I had just before I came here. So this isn't something you have to do out loud. It's just something to kind of think through and the benefit of this is that you can just do it in privacy, you know, for all, all intents and purposes, you look like you're just taking a little second to chill. Um, so for, for lots of people, this can be a helpful approach. Okay. <clears throat> As I mentioned, these are just one little view and one little way of looking at thoughts and feelings and of course there are a whole range of, of other difficulties and other things that we have to consider. Again I could talk about these uh, till the cows come home I've tried to be kind of really really selective with some of the things that come up particularly in thinking about this uh, within my own therapy room. So one of the main difficulties that often comes up um, when living with migraine is the emotional impact of having a change of sense of uh, identity. So having to cope with this idea that you are different to the person you knew then. Perhaps you are not the mother you wanted to be, not the friend, 
not the colleague. All these different things and that kind of really can uh, take up a lot of our emotional experience and that can kind of really relate to a lot of the um, content that you might see in your thoughts and feelings. So I did want to touch on just um, a little bit of uh, some ideas that we that we have in psychology that can help with some of those difficulties and a bit of a four step process for this that I've tried to define. So number one is to acknowledge and give permission to the sense of grief. The reason why I put this is that um, what I often see for lots and lots of people is that they can really dismiss the experience of grief and that sense of sadness. Often that might be that we do lots of kind of natural pushing away of our own sadness and difficulty. And that can mean that it just kind of snowballs and creates a bit of a, a jack in the box type effect. So we have to always acknowledge and kind of give permission to what is going on as that sense of grief and sadness. The other reason why I add this on is because there are lots and lots of people who feel like it's not permissible to grieve um, when there hasn't been a bereavement or death. So that is our kind of common sense model that we have. And the model we have in, in the UK is that that grief process is attached to a death. And whilst there may have not been a physical death, there is still a loss. And there is a loss in terms of maybe your change in your uh, identity. There may be kind of real literal losses in terms of people who are no longer able to work um, or kind of different hobbies that you might have enjoyed before or even just, yeah, whatever it is that that has changed for you. So I always want to acknowledge that this is difficult, that there has been a loss. And so we need to really make space for that. However, we still want to kind of find a way forward. And so what we try and think about is to think a little bit more about this concept of you. And in particular, this concept of, of who you are is often attached to different rules that we might have about ourselves. So for instance, the ones I hear a lot are, I always have to do my best, or I must not make a fuss. And that may be different beliefs and different rules for living that have been really helpful to get you this far in life and may have been developed pre-migraines. And the challenge is, is that when those rules are in the context of a life with migraine, that that might not feel so possible anymore. So the idea of I always have to do my best might be all well and good until you are going through a migraine and trying to push through in order to still get the housework done and feeling like you have to keep going and pushing and pushing until the point of pure uh, exhaustion. Equally, other things I hear are, I must not make a fuss, therefore finding it really difficult to be able to um, connect with the medical professionals around you and be able to say when there is um, a kind of real period of difficulty where you're needing some support. So we try and kind of recognise these rules that you have with yourself and see what kind of behaviour that directs you towards, seeing if you can be a little bit flexible with these uh, ideas, seeing if this actually fits in with the situation that I'm in now, does this idea still work for me? And then um, third, thirdly, that in, in try, trying to reconnect with this sense of you, it can be really helpful to think back into what is that kind of real meaning of what you value and what is the most dear and important to you. For instance, in thinking that um, in the idea that you might not be the mother that you were, the partner, for instance, in thinking, OK, what is it about that relationship or about that that you really value and the kind of qualities that you really want to demonstrate? And if we can make it about quality rather and qualities and, um, and, and those sorts of things rather than just what you're achieving, Sometimes that can feel a bit more meaningful and a bit more helpful and allows us to be a little bit more flexible with how we can behave in line with that value in a way that still fits in with our migraine context. So, for instance, in thinking, actually, what really matters to me in um, being a partner is, is to kind of make sure that I'm being supportive. Um, there might be moments where things come up and make that more difficult. Therefore, I can always make sure that I'm clear that I um, always take the time to listen when I can, for instance. 
whatever that is, all those things that you really, really want to connect to. Um, this is an approach based on uh, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, in which kind of really, really connects to the things that matter the most to us. And finally, again, this idea that the weather changes, but the sky will always be constant. Your health will change, your emotions will change, um, your tastes in music, your tastes in fashion, all of those things over the years have always changed through that trajectory, but there will always be a part of you that has remained constant. And we notice that as the person who is observing and seeing all, all, all of those things go over, over the years. So trying to hold on to that bit of you that will always be constant. And finally, um, I want to acknowledge that actually how we manage thoughts and feelings and these kinds of ideas are part of, again, a broader toolkit with how you cope with living with migraine on the idea that if we can have a range of different strategies in living well with migraine, that this can reduce some of the emotional impact that that has on us. So these are a lot of the ideas that I work with um, in, in using what's called like a self self management um, type approach uh, for migraine. Um, and these are often kind of the more practical, the more tangible strategies. So things like how we can make our activities more manageable, how we can pace things out, moving towards kind of more helpful and realistic goals. So the idea of how we kind of um, break things down into more manageable steps, how we kind of cope when we have some natural setbacks, um, perhaps having some plans for how we deal with um, flare-ups, how we utilise um, support around us and some practical strategies around how we communicate with confidence, um, particularly with some of the, the tricky and pesky questions and comments that can come up. Equally, that um, I do work not work in uh, isolation, and so we always kind of think about how you can kind of best utilise your medical team around you. Um, and I wanted to use this to think about equally if you are wanting to build that into a psychological support team and to think a little bit more about accessing support. I know this is a really, really tricky issue uh, across the whole of the UK and particularly um, from a migraine context and kind of finding the right support that's available to you. Um, so I just wanted to touch on this to explain a little bit more about how services work. So first off, the, um, every area of the country now has a kind of talking therapy service. Um, it was an initiative set up years and years ago to increase provisions for psychological therapies. Um, so everyone can have access to this. This is called Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, known as IAPT for short. If you're wanting to find the one in your area, I encourage you to just Google the name of your area and the letters IAPT and it will come up with your particular service. These services are often based around cognitive behavioural therapy and they are a stepped care approach so they kind of um, try some kind of low level interventions to see if that's helpful for you and they kind of move up to other more intensive therapies so that's how they work. They have a particular part of their pathway that's designed to support people with long-term health conditions so that does it include migraine. Obviously not every therapist has had experience of migraine um, but what we know from research is actually the most important thing um, in terms of the benefit you get from therapy is more about the relationship that you have with that person so it's obviously just about building that. Um, second off, uh, I just wanted to kind of touch on uh, some other kind of charity provisions. Uh, of course, Migraine Trust is a fantastic charity, but um, there are other charities out there that can offer support, particularly around mental health and well-being. So um, MIND is probably one of, one of the biggest uh, within the UK. Um, there are others, uh, Calm, Sane, that, that offer lots of different provisions. But MIND does offer um, kind of different groups, different things that can be helpful. Uh, sometimes just for kind of improving your well-being and having time out of, out of home, for instance. Um, they do offer low-cost counselling as well. Um, so if counselling is more used as like a space just to offload everything rather than strategy focused, um, but they can off offer that on a low-cost basis. Um, they also have a whole range of resources um, to uh, support individuals with uh, any other mental health difficulties, uh, anxiety, depression, so on. Um, I use a lot of their stuff so um it's very good uh, quality um thirdly that psychology kind of via medical and pain teams 
this is a bit of a tricky issue actually when it comes to headache provision specifically. This may not apply to you if you are not under a medical team and you're kind of managing things through the GP um, or perhaps on your own, of course, but to those where that is relevant, if you're under a medical team, it's always worth asking whether there are any um, provisions to psychology kind of within your headache team, neurology team, whatever that is. Um, it's, yeah, you just need to kind of do a little, little bit of asking about that. It's not possible in every single hospital and service, but um, it's worth exploring. Equally, there are pain management services in every area of the country. However, provisions for this within a headache context um, are at times limited. They're often kind of more focused around fibromyalgia and musculoskeletal conditions. Again, worth asking and exploring within your specific area of the country. Finally, I haven't touched on the most difficult thoughts and feelings, but I appreciate that um, they are there. Um, so if there are kind of these kind of real urgent struggles, thoughts around life not being worth living, um, etc., I would encourage you to utilise the support that is out there. Um, the GP is always your kind of first line of uh, defence for that kind of difficulty. Um, I appreciate it's difficult to tell receptionist what is going on, but that being said, if that's possible, then then um, you can be seen within that day. Uh, Samaritans are also really, really helpful um, for talking through if you don't want an action plan, you just want to talk about why this is really difficult, just in that really difficult moment, um, particularly at 2am, that kind of thing, that, that can be really helpful. Okay. So hopefully this now gives us a moment. Oops to come to some conversations. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was really excellent. Thank you. Um, Mags, uh, I think there's some questions. So Mags is just going to run through them and we'll carry on for, for as long as, as we've got till the 1.30 finish. So I'll just hand over to Mags. Thanks again, Sophie. Thanks, Sophie. Um, so that was really interesting and informative. Thank you. I particularly liked what you said about coping with a changed life and a changed identity and how that's one of the most discussed aspects of therapy. Um, so the cycle about the difficult thoughts, emotions and bodily symptoms. There's quite a few questions about that that I'll come on to. Um, the, the chat was very quiet during your presentation. Um, I'm sure people were very much concentrating on what you had to share with us today. So that's a good thing, I think. But uh, we have got some questions coming in. Sure. Okay. So um, first thing then, um, first question, I get a lot of anxiety in between migraines, worrying mm -hmm. that the next migraine, about the next migraine, when it'll be, etc. This is often the most overwhelming, more overwhelming than the migraines themselves and becomes a vicious circle. How yeah. would you suggest dealing with this? And someone else has also said, yeah, I feel scared every day. Yeah, yeah, this is, again, an, another one that kind of really common things that comes up. So we talk about this in terms of pre-anticipatory uh, anxiety, if we kind of want to mm -hmm. make it technical. Sometimes I think having a bit of a name for it helps you know that you are not the only one, of course. So... Uh, Gosh, yes. How do you how do you deal with that? That's that's a really really good question. Um, I'm only taking a moment to pause because obviously how we how we deal with that kind of depends on what the kind of particular circumstances are for people. However, this kind of does come to this idea of thinking a little bit more about what is it in particular um, about the attacks that feels really challenging. Is that about the physical sensation? Is that about the idea of, of, of whether you can cope or not? And so that's why I that kind of um, it included those as the, the thoughts that often come up for people. So the fear that then this this is going to come again, and I don't know how how I can cope. So we there are some people who deal better with a kind of practical perspective in terms of making sure that you know what your plan is, um, that you know exactly how you're going to manage, and knowing that whenever it comes, that you you are prepared to 
deal with it as kind of best best you can um, and equally in terms of how you can manage some of those beliefs around not being able to cope um, and and then equally kind of this this is where we come to the whole toolkit idea and having kind of different ways to manage some of the practical issues that come up so for a lot of people for instance the the uh, anticipatory in anticipatory anxiety can come when we're aware that we can be in kind of different social circumstances and the kind of fear that I might have to be dealing with it then and therefore we might be thinking with you a little bit more about how you can kind of communicate with confidence um about about migrants and kind of knowing then that you've got your toolkit and you you will be able to get through it okay sorry I'm just uh Looking at another question. Okay, so um, one here then about um, bodily symptoms, really. Mm -hmm. So um, I wonder if Sophie has any suggestions for managing symptoms when I feel really disassociated. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably Alice in Wonderland syndrome, but I feel very tall or small, like a slug, and my perception of the environment disappears. So mm -hmm. there's no chance of grounding then because it feels like everything's gone a bit strange. Okay, okay. I would say uh, when uh, disassociating, the best evidence base we have is for those grounding strategies. Um, so that's why I did kind of bring that in. Um, and we do that a lot with people who are, who, who, who experience some of those uh, neurological symptoms. However, I might argue that obviously the one that I put in is quite a lengthy slightly more advanced or complex one that might not feel possible within that particular situation so some more basic grounding strategies is anything from a kind of um a smell or something sensory that will kind of pull 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 you back in so if that's having a, a tissue or a handkerchief that has kind of peppermint oils or a kind of pleasant pleasant smell for you something soothing that you could utilize and um, there are obviously I know smell can be quite challenging for people with migraines so what we can equally think of is something as basic as um, pushing your feet into the ground becoming aware that you are here and kind of really connecting to the here and now sensation and sometimes just kind of being um aware that your feet are in the ground that your um that your that your bottoms on the chair whatever that is and um, sometimes just those that are kind of really kind of physical concrete things and um, can be a bit more manageable uh, to go through okay thank you um so I'm sure I'm not alone in finding the guilt aspect difficult to navigate, having to incorporate rest time into my week, having to mm -hmm. say no to family and friends, et cetera. So mm -hmm. Sophie, have you got any advice on how to explain to others to help them understand that we're feeling bad about saying no and we need to rest? Okay. Um, so that we don't feel worse about ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So I guess this is a bit of a two pronged approach at number one in terms of how we kind of manage and cope with some of that guilt in recognizing some of the spirals that we can get into uh, in particular. And um, I think there's something to be said with um, some of those uh, emotion based strategies that I mentioned that can be particularly helpful with the kind of physical like sensation of guilt when it can really kind of take over you so just acknowledging okay this is here i hear you right i know i know why you're here but i'm still going to focus on the thing that i really need to do right now um, i can hear you guilt but this is what i need that also comes alongside uh, kind of some of the ideas that I mentioned around uh, uh, communicating with confidence um, and how to talk to people about migraines. Um, again, I could do a whole other mm -hmm. session on this. Um, there is a blog that I wrote for the Migraine Trust on, uh, I think it's officially called uh, Isolation and Migraine, but that does include um, some strategies on how we can um, feel, a, feel, feel a bit more confident with those kinds of things. Some of that is about um, developing some assertiveness based techniques um, to know why you're doing this to give yourself a little bit of that boost that you need in order to feel more confident some of that is also um trying to think through the kind of messages that we're giving so we're not 
you know, trying not to dismiss the experience, but equally not trying to give a message that's completely overwhelming. Often the really difficult responses we get from people is based um, on a lack of uh, understanding or that they just feel uh, overwhelmed and completely helpless and hopeless. And therefore you all get stuck in this ongoing cycle. So because we can't change what the other person is doing, ultimately we can only change what we're doing and what we're communicating because we have to start somewhere in order to break that cycle. I'm not saying that what other, other people are doing is necessarily helpful and, and shouldn't need to be changed, but um, ultimately we can only control ourselves in that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so a lot of people resonating with that kind of thing, feeling that people treat them as if they're being a hypochondriac. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and someone asking about how to support a partner um, if, if you're not the one that has migraine themselves, but you're trying to support someone else. Yeah. And I guess that that kind of comes into this um, process in recognising yeah, that there are two, two people who are stuck in this cycle of kind of feeling quite helpless and quite hopeless. Um, I would say then it's just about being really clear together about an action plan that's needed and what that person is wanting. Um, it's really difficult for me to say what you should do to support your partner because it may be that they want something completely different to what I think would be helpful. So I think kind of open and clear conversations about that, having a plan together that's not made during an attack. And ideally, if you do have, you know, kind of milder or pain-free moments um, to, to think about it a little bit more clearly, then um, in the same way that, um, you know, in thinking about how you support your partner, you probably don't talk about it in the heat of an argument. So yeah. it's that same thing again, trying to think through what is the way to manage tax? What do they want? Do they want to be left alone or do they want to be checked on? Um, thinking through how you want to manage um, when they're feeling blue about it. Do they want a fix or do they just want um, some space? Um, how are you going to manage and navigate uh, being asked to different events and one of you not being able to go, that kind of thing. I think having a clear plan and that, and that is often the case as well, particularly with those with children um, and, and kind of having flare up plans, for instance, and ways of, of navigating that, that often like a traffic light system can be really helpful. Um, so green is like a, um, a fairly good day mummy will be as normal and can kind of come and pick you up from school the amber day might be that things are a bit more difficult and you might need to go and our study for things a red day um is where mummy might not be able to come and pick you up from school and things are going to be really tricky and you're going to need to be quiet in the house so that I, I I use that metaphor to kind of slip in the the stuff about um how we support children as well but often having a bit of a uh, analogy can be helpful because then someone can have just a quick far away of uh, communi uh, communicating what where they're at and what their needs are and what the action plan needs to be. Okay, thank you. So some, uh, I can't keep up with the questions that are coming oh. in now. I apologise a lot of them. long <laughs> to ask anything. So I'm just trying to pick out the ones that I think are going to be the most valuable to most people, really. Yeah. So questions around the physical aspects of it. So mm -hmm. from having an aura or the sign of attack to actually experiencing, there can be a large gap of many hours, so it's not instantaneous for me. Mm -hmm. That means waiting for the pain to start for an unknown time. Have you got any tips for dealing with the wait? Okay. Oh, um, yeah. I, I guess it is, it's sort of difficult to say without um, kind of knowing the specific circumstances and where you might be and what's kind of practically feasible. Um, so I would be kind of thinking maybe about some of the strategies that can be helpful around um, some of the self-talk. Um, so there's something called coping self-statements that can be quite helpful. Those things you want to repeat to yourself. Um, I have uh, clients I work with who have a little postcard that they write to themselves. That's the things that they want to remember when you kind of first get those signs that something's difficult or particularly during a flare up. And they might be things you want to kind of come back to. Um, there may be strategies, things like kind of... Um, anything that helps to to soothe you to reduce some of that extra tension a little bit um that yeah i guess we can think about that in the same way as the uh, anticipatory uh, uh anxiety stuff 
that yeah some of these things can be helpful yeah and I guess the same would apply to some of these other questions about physical symptoms so people talking about hemiplegic migraine and not being able to focus on your thoughts and feelings when you've got symptoms that are very physical in, yeah. including aura yeah um, Absolutely. And there, you know, I've, I've got, it was so difficult to write this because there are so many different avenues and so many different directions you can take. And that's why I'm really, really clear to say this doesn't replace um, a full kind of, uh, there's lots of helpful books and resources and psychological therapy um, that then might apply kind of more specifically to things. But there are strategies that then are a bit more physical. Um, and if someone feels like that's more manageable, so for instance, kind of more recognising um, some of the physical sensations that are coming up associated with a particular emotion, some people find that more helpful, just kind of trying to ground yourself, um, reduce some of that extra tension, for instance, that, yeah, we don't always connect to our thoughts and emotions, and that's, we can't do that every second of every day, it's just trying to be generally more aware that we try and think about. Yeah. OK, and a few questions around um, parenting, really, you know, even considering being a parent when one of you has migraine and the fear that the burden that that might place, especially on children and the family. Yeah. So anticipatory stuff again, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh, this is one. This is this is a real kind of passion of mine. I've having come from uh, children's headache services now into uh, adult services and kind of seeing particularly how families kind of construct and deal with uh, living in with migraine within the family from kind of different uh, perspectives is obviously such a phenomenal issue. And um, this comes up time and time again, particularly in uh, anxiety around how you cope without your medication, um, in pregnancy, um, thoughts about how you'd be able to manage that kind of thing, um, how you'd cope with flare ups when you have children. Um, obviously from a practical perspective, I want to kind of remind people that there will always be these worries and challenges, even if you didn't have migraine, um, that we know those decisions are really, really difficult. Um, I would kind of come back to a values perspective, I think, in kind of really connecting with what would really matter for you in parenting. Is parenting and kind of giving to another just about having a child or is it about something else if this is something that's really meaningful for you then can you think about other strategies that you have to help you and, and so that's with that that kind of final final toolkit slide I have um strategies that can help you to cope with pregnancy um, and equally we know there are many many parents with migraine given the uh, large number of people who have migraine and the large number of people who have children. We know the two do come together and people do manage that. Um, and so, for instance, the traffic light system, one tiny, tiny little example of a strategy that we can have to support children with managing what is difficult. Um, we have to acknowledge that it's it's not easy for children. However, given the right support, if you're mindful, kind of beforehand and aware of, of how to challenge, uh, how, how to manage some of the challenges that might come up from that, can still be okay. Yeah, absolutely. So just two more questions then, because we are very short of time now, and I know you've got an appointment uh, with a patient next, haven't you? So, um, so a lot of chat in the in the chat itself about treatment options people you know their migraines aren't currently well controlled treatments haven't necessarily worked so a lot of nice exchanges between people about mm -hmm. what to do yeah. so um you mentioned about the weather changes it's not always going to be like this but sometimes when people there's one particular question here how do we set, tell ourselves it's temporary if the migraine is no longer episodic but it's become chronic and daily that's yeah. what i find so hard Absolutely. Um, I would add that my entire caseload is chronic um, and uh, yeah, and kind of particularly true uh, individuals who have um, struggled with different medical treatments. Uh, so I, I do hear you. I think I had to really write this presentation and remember that, that, that there is the whole broad spectrum. Uh, so um, I definitely acknowledge uh, that those experiences are very, very real. I think sometimes, you know, some of these metaphors are just little ideas and little nuggets, um, but obviously there is a lot of that that is going to feel more difficult. And thinking about that and kind of recognising that you 
do go through a different journey and there is a lot for people particularly in in that transition of life from uh, episodic to chronic um, and that comes up with a whole range of um, different issues and uh, therefore that perhaps that idea that things may change actually that might not feel helpful for you so I can uh, understand that in which case then I'd probably come back to a more values based um, uh, perspective so that idea of actually kind of reconnecting with the things that really matter to you and how you can um, live life aligned with those within the new situation and context that you're in now so I work with a lot of people who aren't able to to go to work anymore and that can feel really challenging. But when we look at it, it's not the idea that they went to work. It, like it's it's never just on face value. It's instead about an opportunity to to give back or an opportunity to meet other people. And therefore we can think instead, all right, so work doesn't feel possible now because of living with a chronic condition. Okay, so how can we help you to um, socialize more? How can we help you to have a sense of giving back through some part time volunteering or whatever kind of small act is manageable and, and feasible within your particular context? I think it's about really remembering that every single win, no matter how small, is still a win. And those things that are going to kind of resonate for you there, it's not really just about the big things that happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that all ties in what you were talking about, about identity, doesn't it? And it changing. Yeah. So um, the last set of questions, I'll kind of read them, you know, the, give you the flavour of what they're about, really, because it's all focusing on access to treatment. Mm. So um, you talk, you did acknowledge how difficult it is, yeah. um, especially in the UK at the moment, to access that kind of, of treatment. Yeah. Um, so so kind of things people are asking is any advice on finding a clinical psychologist? It seems very tricky path to go down or to get an appointment. Um, does Sophie offer talking therapy and how can we contact her? Um, and a question that you actually addressed in the tech in the in the talk really about I'm paying privately to have CBT counseling, but it's gen it's generic. Um, they deal with everything. Would yeah. it be more helpful to have counseling from someone who specializes in migraine? And if so, how do you access it privately or ideally through the NHS? And you kind of covered that, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, oh, I really, really, really feel this. Oh, I want to speak to every every person who uh, asked that. Um, oh, this is really going to be difficult to let me finish. <laughs> okay. Oh, right. So, so I did kind of touch more on the uh, NHS kind of services and thinking about free and, and low cost services. Um, and they are, there are so many different fantastic therapists and often people really strive on this idea of finding a specialist in migraine. And um, the reality is, is that that can be quite tricky. Um, I, there are specialists in uh, neurology, there are specialists in pain conditions, um, but myself and a uh, psychologist that I line manage, we are the only psychologists who are kind of full specialists in headache conditions, migraine, um, that I've found. <laughs> but there are people who kind of do work within that kind of general area. So they might not advertise themselves as a full whack migraine specialist but they might still have worked with those kind of similar difficulties and um, so it's really worth kind of keeping an open mind with that equally as I mentioned and I can't stress this enough is that it's never really about that person's experience and um, it's about the relationship we have with them we've had all these years of different types of therapy approaches and different methods and really the main thing that, that always affects the outcome is is the relationship so as long as you feel like you can trust them and kind of work through different things a lot of therapists if they've not worked with that particular medical condition they're just really keen to understand and work with you and be on your side um, to support you through that process and um, whenever I've ever worked with a medical condition that I don't know do my best to read up to understand and to think with that person about how they can help me to understand what's going on with them and that's the benefit that actually if you go with a migraine specialist they might also have a preset idea as to what you're mm. going with so that's on the the kind of flip side of things um it sounds like there was also a question about how to access private clinical psychology and um, accessing yes. nhs clinical psychology is tricky um 
it's effectively you have to kind of work up a bit of a system and the ladder um always worth exploring kind of because as it's mostly psychologists who work in kind of pain services and medical services as well so that often is a little bit more straightforward um within mental health services yeah you, you will access more like a cbt therapist that kind of thing but still fantastic uh, clinicians um and yeah definitely worth uh, pursuing clinical private psychologists are the most expensive private psychologist private therapist you can possibly find um so we get private counselors private therapists psychologists are the ones that we do manage to add on a hefty hefty charge so depending on what area of the country you're in i've seen prices from 90 to 150 pounds an hour for a session um and they uh, most private uh, psychologists do work under health health insurers so if that's something you can access it is worth kind of thinking through some of them have you know you get as part of your policy provision to 10 sessions etc um so they are things that are worth looking at um it's not something i've, I've led with as part of the presentation because obviously i want things to be accessible to everyone um Absolutely. So one yeah. last thing then, just in terms of accessibility, people have mentioned a lot yeah. of apps and helpful things. They're yes. all in the chat yes. for people to read. But yeah. is there any online support that you would recommend? Anything that, that um, might fill that gap? Yeah, again, uh, oh, it's tricky, like the kinds of things I'm not sure whether I can mention. And that was okay. when I thought about mentioning my own services. <laughs> and like, can I can I advertise what I do? Um, good question. Um, I don't know how much I can mention on okay. this. Um, there are resources being developed by a particular team in the country to offer more provisions for self-management strategies in particular. Um, so that kind of final toolkit that I had um, on, on, on the penultimate slide, um, that some of the kind of more uh, emotional and practical strategies for living with migraine, there is a team that are developing that to be available online, which the Migraine Trust probably know about. Um, yeah so okay. thank you you've said, be, you've said enough it is, it okay. is coming it's coming yeah thank you so much so i'll hand back over to debbie now we've gone a bit over time but just because we started a little late oh thank you thank you so much sophie that was just amazing like always uh, so we really can't thank you enough for giving up your time and thank you to everyone for joining us we really hope that you got a lot out of the session um just to let you know our next Managing Your Migraine event is actually a face-to-face -face event. Uh, it is being held at the Hilton Metropole in London on Sunday, the 11th of September. For those that can't make it face-to-face, um, -face, we will be live streaming the event and details of both the face-to-face -face and the live streaming will be on our website soon. So keep checking back. And if you want to sign up for that, we would love to meet you in person or um, see you online. So yeah, like I say, just keep looking out for that. And um, I wish you all a good afternoon and hopefully see you all soon.